William, how you doing, bud? Doing great, Aaron. How are you, man? Doing, doing great. And, um, uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you, um, how often you're asked about being a part of that 1992 team and how much of, uh, how important a part of your life has it been over the years? I mean, I would say, uh, you know, as far as being asked about it, you know, as the years go on and I think, uh, you know, as Coach Saban continues on the, the dynasty run that he's on, you know, the, as the years go by, like you said, um, you know, the kids that are in school now and um, you know, I'm, I'm middle-aged now myself, um, you know, I think it's, it lessens a little bit as time goes on. I mean, certainly I get asked about it. You know, every once in a while somebody will recognize my name if I'm somewhere. And, you know, they'll ask me about that experience, which was wonderful. But, um, you know, I, I still, you know, I've, I've been front and center you know, for the, the Saban dynasty, but I'll still argue with anybody or debate anybody that wants to um, bring to the table and question whether or not that 92 defense wasn't um, the best defense of all time at Alabama. Um, you know, even last year, you know, when that when that group was under consideration, um, you know, when you look at the stats, you know, I think it was nine and some change points per game given up in 92. You know, they could pressure the quarterback with three people. Um, you know, God help the opposing offense. Decided to bring four. Um, it uh, it wasn't a pretty sight, but great group of guys, uh, great team, and uh, you know, it's 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 nice played a, a small part, um, you know, in Alabama football history. William, how often does that uh, does that team get together? Um, as, as as you get older, you know, people start getting married, having kids, and um, kind of life takes over, but uh, you guys were part of something special that will always bind you, even more so than already being a part of a team. You were part of a championship team. Uh, how, how often does that group get together? Well, you know, the university has, you know, the reunion type deals for um, all the teams every five years, you know, where they're honored on the field and there's a get together on Friday night uh, beforehand. But, and like you said, you know, as, as people get older and get married, you know, you're right in the middle of, you know, high school and Little League football season right now. So, you know, life things sometimes make it more difficult. But, you know, we all stay in touch. I mean, you know, the, the, the different people that, you know, were friends and hung out together while we were in school there for four or five years still remain in touch. You know, Facebook and social media, you know, is kind of taking that part of it over versus face-to-face get-togethers. But, it, you know, we, we still stay in touch, uh, I, I talked to uh, my roommate of, of three and a half, four years, John Clay, a, a fellow offensive lineman last night. So um, that was about a, a Labrador retriever puppy, not not college football. But, um, <laughs> you know, we, we stay in touch more than people would think. Um, you know, back then, I don't know if you lived in the athletic dorm, but there were such things as athletic dorms, I think, I think probably helped the team chemistry some, you know, you're, you're around each other. You don't go your separate ways after practice. Basically you're eating at the same place. You're living at the same place. Do you think that had any impact on, on the, on the bond and the closeness of that team? Well, I think the biggest thing it did, uh, contributed to Aaron was, you know, it allowed the coaching staff, I think, to have a, uh, you know, better capability of keeping people in check. You know, they were all in one place. Uh, you know, during the week, there's, you know, curfew on Thursday night that was checked. You know, of course, we were, you know, locked up in the, the Capstone Inn on Friday nights if we were at home and, you know, in a way on the road in a hotel together. But, yeah, certainly, um, you know, it, it was a different time and, a, you know, a different era of college football back then. Um, you know, there there was 14 straight days of two-a-days. Um, every practice, um, you know, you went full pads once and had helmets and shoulder pads the next. Um, so it was it was a grind. Um, you know, but the first day of school starting in August was always a welcome event. William, what, last question. I mean, I could talk about the 92 team all day, but last question before we move on to this year's team is, is there a favorite moment, favorite game of that season for you? Um, you know, I think for me at least, uh, because it was such a, a close game and the dramatic fashion in which it ended. Um, you know, I would have to say the SEC championship game against Florida. Um, you know, that, that, the way that thing, you know, ended there with Langham making the, the pick six. And, you know, that's a guy right there that I don't think is celebrated enough by Alabama fans. You know, I still hear people, um, you know, being derogatory towards uh, Antonio. 
um, you know, over the NCAA stuff that happened later on. But, you know, there wouldn't have been a national championship um, that year without Antonio Lang. I mean, you know, blocking punts, pick sixes, um, you know, like two weeks in a row. Um, you know, against Auburn, he had a pick six, and the pick six against Florida to, to seal the win. Uh, just an outstanding football player, and, you know, one of my favorite teammates. Yeah, again, I could go over that um, 92 team all day long, especially that defense. I'd love to hear some stories. Or maybe I'll get you a beer one day. You can tell me what it was like to go up against that that front seven. Oh yeah, practice. yeah. I, I'll tell you. I'll tell you one <laughs> one funny story. We can kind of switch over to current events. And I may have told you this in private, you know, before, but it, it's worth uh, the airwaves. When uh, Mario Cristobal was first hired as the offensive line coach, um, you know, we reconnected. You know, from knowing each other for a week during that you know practice for the national championship game, and he still to this day has nightmares. Of uh, you know going up against John Copeland, and uh, I said, well, you know, man, there's you know there's no shame in you know getting beat beaten a couple times by you know a first round draft pick. And uh, he goes, dude, you don't understand, man. He said, my whole family saw it; it was on national television, and um, it was just humiliating. And I said, listen, you're barking up the wrong tree uh, if you're looking for some sympathy about having to go up against John Copeland for three hours once in your life. Try doing it three hours a day, every day for two years. <laughs> That's a great story. And, of course, Cope, uh, Cope still lives here in the Tuscaloosa area. I have to remind him of that. Uh, talking to William Bardry, he was a member of that 1992 national championship team, also uh, is keeps up to date with all the current goings on with this year's team. Where do you think this team is now, um, William, after, after six games? Uh, um, you know, a lot of people, I guess, down after an eight-point win on the road against a pretty good, decent, at least, Texas A&M team. I guess, I guess maybe that just speaks to how high expectations are here. Um, you know, I, I think myself. You know, I was busy last week, and I didn't really have a chance to, uh, you know, look at look at Texas A&M very much, and and uh, kind of caught me off guard a little bit, but. You know, I think there's a chance. If, you know, we'll see how the rest of the season plays out for them. But I thought John Chavis, you know, came up with a great uh, game plan. Uh, you know, going into that game, they were second in the country in sacks. Um, you know, only giving up 118 yards per game. Um, so, you know, that could end up being, you know, one of the best front sevens, you know, that the team faces probably until they get into the playoffs. Um, you know, they've got a young, uh, I think, emerging star at quarterback. And, uh, you know, you're going to have games like that. I mean, we had, you know, going back to 92, um, you know, we had several games like that that we probably didn't go out and perform. And I think that's something that, you know, fans have a hard time grasping, is especially after seeing the, you know, the two beatdowns in a row against Vanderbilt and Ole Miss. Um, you know, that was a definite uptick in competition last week for Texas A&M. Uh, but, you know, you're not going to get, a team's a, a game every week. It's just that's just part of it. Um, you know, the, the concentration's not there. I mean, you know, kids have problems with their girlfriends. You know, problems at home. Um, yeah, I think that's something that's allowed Coach Saban to become, uh, you know, the, the great head coach that he is. And I think he probably does a better job than any head coach I've seen. You know, being able to get the players to compartmentalize those problems and keep their focus. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it's not something to worry about. Um, you know, I thought Alabama, you know, they left some sugar out there on the field. They, they, they could have, you know, it could have easily have been a, you know, a 40 to, to a 19 game, you know, if some things had gone their way, you know, missed passes, drop passes, um, you know, the fumble, obviously, the block punt, you know, there's all kinds of things kind of factored in on that, uh, that final score, you, know, you got to give up the opponent credit. You know, they made plays when they had to at certain times. So, um, it's, it's, you know, you're, you're, you know how special this fan base is, Aaron, and how fickle it is. And it's a, I don't look at it this way, but, you know, it's a national championship robust fan base right now. Yeah, no doubt about that. Um, given that your expertise and, and, and experience on the offensive line, I wanted to ask you about Matt Womack. Uh, has he played better than you thought he was capable of playing? Because I, I, I'll be honest, I didn't know he was as let it, as athletic as he is. Not that he's some world beater, but I, you know, it, it's tough to see with these big, especially a guy who's six seven. You're sometimes surprised that that some guys move as well as they do. Yeah, he's uh, 
he's performed higher than than my expectations were. You know, I think, uh, and I'm not just going to single him out. I thought that was the worst offensive line performance um, Saturday night that I've seen for the season. Um, you know, they they really struggled uh, with that double eagle look that Chavis gave them on running plays, having the two guards in the center covered up by defensive tackles. Um, the pass protection was was very poor. Um, you know. There, there wasn't a very good pocket um, for Hurts to get comfortable in. Um, you know, if you go back and look at that sequence uh, right before halftime when they tried to run the two-minute drill, um, you know, on the, the second to the last play before the half, Womack got beat with an outside bull rush. And then on the very next play, Womack and Lester Cotton both got beat. Um, but, you know, when you look at what, you know, Texas A&M sacks production has been, you know, that's something I think that a lot of people that, you know, having been pleased with the quarterback play needs to, uh, you know, factor into their evaluations. You know, if that had been a pro-style quarterback, if that had been Jake Coker or A.J. McCarron, you know, Texas A&M may have, may have matched their 11 sack total, um, you know, that they had against South Carolina a couple of weeks ago. Well, yeah, they, I, there, there were some plays where, as you mentioned, Alabama did not block them well up front. That was a very underrated Texas A&M defense they faced. Um, is, is, you know, I hate to give Nick Saban any more, um, ammunition, but uh, well, you know, I'm looking at this schedule and, you know, certainly if Alabama doesn't play its a game and another team jumps up there, you can always lose if you self-destruct and turn the ball over a ton, but I'm looking at this schedule and I don't see anybody that can play with Alabama until they get to Auburn. Do you think it's any chance that an, that an LSU or Mississippi state can give them a game? You know, I certainly, when you look at what, you know, the game plan that Dave Aranda came up with, and it was basically the same one that John Chavis came up with last year, you know, running that double eagle front, you know, to kind of slow the the inside running game down. Um, you're having a linebacker spot hurts. Um, I think they could slow the offense down. Now, I don't think, based on what I've seen up to this point, that, that LSU's got a dynamic enough offense um, to – you know, really pose a, a significant threat or a consistent threat as far as putting up a lot of points. They haven't put up a lot of points, you know, on any of the decent teams that they've played this year. I, I think we'll get a better idea about that LSU team and probably a better idea about Auburn um, after this Auburn-LSU matchup on Saturday. But no, I, I'm, I'm with you, Aaron. I think, uh, um, you know, probably by the time that they get to uh, Mississippi State and LSU, um, you know, both of those teams aren't really going to be playing for anything. Um, maybe another, uh, you know, a, a small bowl game. Um, so, but yeah, I agree with you. It's probably all going to come down to the Iron Bowl. 